Welcome to Redefining Medicine, an intimate and personalized program that illustrates a different side of the practice of medicine. Our in-depth conversations will focus on the physicians and practitioners who are redefining medicine through their integrative, functional, and holistic approach to health and well-being. Hi, and welcome to Redefining Medicine. Today, I'm really excited to be interviewing Dr. Joe Raphael. He is one of the leaders in prevention, biomarkers of aging, and telomeres. And I don't even know where to start the questioning, so I'm gonna ask him to help me. In 2002, you told me that you started focusing on biomarkers of aging. What did that mean? Well, you know, I, I like to think of myself as one of the least well-known pioneers of anti-aging medicine. Yeah. <laughs> um, I've been, Humble. I've been doing this for, <laughs> since I guess 1997 or something like that. Um, uh, I actually got interested in before then, and I opened a practice in Manhattan in the late 90s, um, and it was getting pretty popular. I'd gotten on the Today Show and NBC, and I was treating patients. They were doing well. I was doing a lot of hormone optimization, um, and I was feeling pretty good about things. Uh, Patients were coming to see me, they were mm -hmm. having good results, and Robert Butler, who you may know was the, the late uh, head of the, uh, and founder of the National Institutes on Aging uh, at the NIH, called me and said, would you like to come participate in a, in a sort of a round table to talk about what you do and, and you know, what this whole new field of anti-aging medicine is? So I thought, well, okay. Um, a little bit leery, because perhaps it's gonna be a sacrificial lamb kind of thing where they're gonna <laughs> go after me. But I was interested in it, and it turned out it was actually a pretty nice affair. But one thing struck me when he was sort of going around the table and asking people about how they thought about aging, et cetera, he said to me, look, Joe, you seem like a pretty smart guy. Um, you're treating aging. How do you know you're really altering aging? I mean, it's anti-aging medicine, but you know, what are you doing? And I said, well, my patients feel great. They keep coming back. He said, but no, really, how are you measuring aging? And that got me started to think, you know, Hypertension specialists, they measure blood pressure, right? <laughs> Cardiologists look at the cardiovascular system, they do angiography, they do echocardiography. We're doing things that make people feel better, they look better, their friends are telling them they look better, but are we actually, actually measuring the aging process itself? And it turns out that there's this huge literature out there of other biomarkers for things that weren't thought to be sort of part of the aging process, like spirometry, looking at your FEV1, your lung function, um, your arterial stiffness, your cognitive function. There was a whole literature out there by gerontologists, people who study aging, uh, by even people in, in fields that they didn't even know they were doing aging stuff, but they were using age as one of the markers. For instance, when you do a spirometry test in your office to look for asthma or COPD, you get a lung age because you don't get diagnosed with asthma or COPD if you have the lungs of a 60-year-old. They have to be worse than the lungs of a 60-year-old. But it turns out, the 60 year old's lungs aren't so great. <laughs> you lose about 1% of your lung uh, function per, per year. So I was finding all these biomarkers, so I started incorporating them into my practice. Um, and in 2007, Noel oh, you Patton took it away from me. <laughs> came to, uh, <laughs> came to uh, my, 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 uh, my, uh, my office and said, you know what, would you like to um, offer this new telomerase activator, TA65? to your patients, uh, and I said, well, you know, I had all these nice, these neat biomarkers, so I said, yeah, sure, but let's check and see whether it's actually changing the aging process, and that's what got me interested in this latest biomarker, although not the newest kid on the block anymore, uh, but I still think a very important biomarker. I think you were the first kid on the block. I remember you talking about Elizabeth Blackburn in 2007, and you were like sold. You were going to work on that, you were going to do the study on it, you are going to prove it. Yeah, well, I originally thought, you know, telomeres, what could that have to do with aging? Because a lot of tissues are post-mitotic, you know, cardiac cells don't divide anymore, although we know that may not be true because there's some stem cells there, neurons, et cetera. So I kind of poo-pooed it a little bit, but I started to dig into it. We learned all about the supporting cells, we learned about the immune system and how immune senescence really starts the whole inflammatory process to get the aging of the system. And, and, um, and that's when I, I started getting really excited about it. And then, you know, it happened that the Nobel Prize was awarded two years after I got interested in this thing. I said, you know what, maybe I'm onto something here. You're uh, onto something. Yeah. 
so that was, that's when I, you know, I, I still do a lot of hormone optimization in my practice, and I was, have been really gratified to see how the new biomarkers, uh, telomere length, DNA methylation markers, all show that, in fact, yeah, HRT is anti-aging medicine, despite what they said in 2002 with the WHI. We knew. We knew. We both knew we already. Knew. <laughs> but, uh, they still nice don't know, by the way. Yeah, well, yeah, they're <laughs> slowly, they're slowly coming around. Um, but to find out that, you know, estrogen is a telomerase activator, turns on, probably the reason women have slightly long telomeres, mm -hmm. that slightly longer telomeres than men, is because they have higher estrogen levels, uh, more antioxidant capacity, and it actually turns on telomerase, the enzyme that makes telomeres longer. So seeing all of that come back together and being sort of unified, what I like to call it sort of unified field theory of, of um, you know, the biology of aging as opposed to physics, um, that's been really exciting and, and interesting part of, of putting it all together in practice and then in, in the sort of the translational research that I do. Uh, so I'm a happy physician. I, I enjoy what I do. Well, what you do is really important. And I think when you connect the, the hormones to telomere and length, and it's so important and so few people know. And you were at the very beginning on it, and of it, and you stayed with it, which makes it really interesting because you made the connections. Yeah, well, I mean, that's the other thing is that uh, I talked about, uh, you hear now about how people say telomere length, well, you know, it's not that great a biomarker. It's correlation with chronological age is nothing like the DNA methylation clocks, the, the newest kid on the block, although <laughs> I suppose glycan age is the newest, newest kid on the block, the, the uh, IgG glycosylation. Um, but that's looking at telomeres in the wrong way, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow in, in my talk about uh, measuring telomere length. Your pure correlation with age doesn't make necessarily the best biomarker. There has to be good biology behind why that marker is important. I mean, graying hair is a great biomarker of aging, but it doesn't tell you anything about the health of the person necessarily. It's just a marker, whereas telomeres are at the, so I think, very top of the um, uh, sort of what we say in signaling upstream of a lot of other signaling transduction pathways where um, they are really important. So even though they don't correlate perfectly with age uh, and DNA methylation does much more, we know much more about the biology of why that is and we know, you know how to affect it. And so I still think it's very important. And then now, just recently, we're learning that DNA methylation and epigenetics is related as well to telomere length and that you know, the sirtuins, which are sort of the regulators of your, your epigenome, they are telomere uh, stabilizers. And when the sirtuins are shut down, the telomeres get damaged more. That starts a feed forward process that causes more damage. So it's all coming together more. Now it's getting more complex and we have to turn the dials more carefully, um, which you know, I think is good. It gives me a job, but also um, you know, it, it's, it's, it means we also have to be careful. Uh, well, I think it also means that we have to understand what's really going on and to make the connections. You know, because we come from the world of conventional medicine where everything is separated and everything's sub subspecialized. There's a cardiology, like you said, cardiology, nephrology, et cetera. Everything is separated. And what we're learning and what we're doing and what you're doing is that everything's connected. And you can, yeah, you can learn about how telomeres affect, you know, how peptides affect your brain or how hormones affect certain areas of your body, but you don't realize that everything's connected. And I think that, you know, part of what we do here, which is so amazing and so forward thinking, is we're actually helping physicians and providers put things together and realize that there's no one thing that's the answer. Yeah, that's but important. But the answer comes from knowing a lot of different pieces. In your case, you know a lot about telomeres, you know a lot about hormones, you're at the cutting edge. And it's really amazing to watch you over the past 20 years now. <laughs> Shh. Why? Mm -hmm. Actually, it gives That's us right. credibility. It's, it's celebrated. It's, it's celebrated. celebrated. <laughs> Absolutely. It gives you credibility. So I think that what you're teaching in telomeres is really impressive. And having watched you all day today, I think it was really impressive. So tell me about the measurement. That's tomorrow's lecture. Now talk to us about it today. <laughs>
Yeah, I mean, I, I think um, a lot of people, and this goes back to, I think, Bob Butler's comments to me, uh, making your patients feel good and have less pain, have more energy, have more sex drive, have more clarity of thought is all great uh, and absolutely the ultimate goal. But you want to also be able to measure what's happening because there could be off-target things that are happening. I mean, cocaine makes you feel great, makes you have a lot of energy, uh, <laughs> but that's in the short run, right? So, you know, if you looked at the biomarker, the other biomarker at the, that same time, your cognitive function may be really great, um, but your arterial stiffness is high and that's compromising you know, your vascular system and putting you at risk for coronary heart disease or you know, an arrhythmia or something like that. So um, I think the, the, we used to be talking about what's the best biomarker of aging. Um, and if the first thing I would say, you wanna measure whatever you're changing, if you have a tool available to do that. And that's one of the things I'm gonna talk about tomorrow and I'll get into that in a little bit more detail in just a second. But um, you know, they all, as you said, they all interrelate. Uh, and I think that there's no single best biomarker. They all, what we're learning now, I think, with this, um, with this more complex understanding of the aging process, uh, is that you have to, it's, it's system biology. You have to look at it from as many different uh, viewpoints as possible. Because, you know, while it may have one substance, one therapy, be it, you know, a modality, a drug, a supplement, a diet change, you know, may have a beneficial effect in one area. In other biomarkers, it may not be. And you have to try to uh, sort of tweak your therapy so that you get the best overall outcome. Um, I, I work with a software system that I've developed to help me with this called PhysioAge. And we first start out with four major biomarkers, arterial stiffness, pulmonary function, skin elasticity, and cognitive function. And those correlated quite nicely with chronological age if you put them into a multilinear regression model. Um, and then we sort of thought, well, and we give it the overall physio age, and that was sort of the end all and the be all. And then the next biomarker came out, telomere length, and then senescent cell load and naive T cell load, and then epigenetics, and then glycan age, et cetera. And what we're learning is that when I look at the, the outputs from my patients and I measure all these things, and then one person, and we normalize it for, for their age, so we'll give them a telomere age for their, how long their telomeres are in comparison to somebody their age. Uh, we'll give them a cardio age, a pulmo age, a DNA methylation age. Um, keep on trying to make up these names for these ages. Uh, and they'll, they'll look at them and they'll see as a 50-year-old woman and she has a 60-year-old telomer age, a 30-year-old uh, pulmo age, a 20-year-old glycan age. And she'd be like, well, this is a lot of crap. I mean, how can this, <laughs> these are not good biomarkers. I mean, they're, they're not telling me they're not consistent. But no, they the experts consistent. in the field now are saying be it from you know, epigenetics, from telomere biology, is that they are legitimate. There's great studies backing them, hard data. They're just measuring different aspects of the aging process. And there probably isn't a single best biomarker of aging. And it's not the biomarker that correlates best with chronological age, like you know, the first Horvath clock coming out with an R squared of 0.95 or something like that. What you really want to do is get a real understanding of what the weakest systems are in a patient, work on those, Make sure that the good, the good systems are, are continuing to go along at a slow rate of attrition of function. Uh, and that's, I think, really uh, what, what, what I consider my job to be, is to measure the health of my patient and try to keep it as high as possible. Certain things correlate tightly with age, certain things don't. We then give them an overall health uh, status indicator report card where we grade A through F. Uh, I do it for the cardiovascular risk. I do it for, you know, their, for their electrolytes, for their diabetes markers, insulin, insulin resistance. And you know, we give them a grade for each organ system, and then we give them an overall grade. Again, it's just kind of a heuristic at that point because, but you know, if you've got, in, in my, a B plus is like a 3.3, you have very few people, even 25 year olds that are you know, above 3.3. When they're that high, um, you know, these, are, these are people that multiple systems are working really, really well. We haven't published the data, we haven't, you know, we haven't really even analyzed it yet, but I would love to know if you know, five years from now, the higher grade point are really the people that end up having you know, no illnesses, happier at work, feel like they function, they're functioning really well, because that's, that's our goal. You know, the goal used to be to diagnose disease and treat it. Now, the goal is to monitor and assess where you are in the health span and to keep you there as long as possible. Um, and I can, I can go on and on about this stuff, but, but um, feel free. <laughs> just with regards to the telomeres tomorrow, um, telomeres are one of those things, and I'm going to say this tomorrow, you know, 
you get a little bit of humility as you get later and later in this, in this game. And I think in 2011, when the telomere biology stuff came out, I said, I read a little post in my, uh, on my, my website uh, saying, telomeres are the next cholesterol. You know, I thought I was pretty, you know, I actually said that before it was published in some other, uh, in some other uh, journals by other people thinking about it in the field, because there are a lot of analogies, okay? Funny Greek terms that nobody had ever heard of before, right? Um, cholesterol and telomere. Um, but now everybody knows what cholesterol is, everybody knows what their cholesterol number is. And why is that? Well, because there was a way to measure it. And even more importantly, there was a way to change it. Um, telomeres, we're at the point where we have a pretty decent way to measure it. We don't know exactly, perfectly, how to measure it. You know, is it the shortest telomere? Is it this, on this chromosome? Is it in this cell type? Don't know that for sure. And we do have a lot of things that we know that can help to keep telomeres from getting shorter. And we have gene therapy that we know it's not available clinically, but in studies that can, uh, uh, at least in animal models, really reverse aging. But we don't have a super potent drug like a statin to all of a sudden go from a very high cholesterol to a very low cholesterol. Uh, and so that's the thing that I think that, that's, that's waiting, that we're waiting for. Um, I was thinking that everybody by, by now would be, everybody would know their telomere length. Um, and I think what, what's holding that up probably is that we still need to get the telomerase activators, and we have telomerase activators that are, that are reasonable, but until we can get one that can do what we can do in the animal models, that's when we'll be, everybody will want to know their number because they're going to know, okay, that's when I want to, I really want to take something to get it back. So um, I think that, that that's going to come. Uh, the gene, the gene uh, therapy studies are, are underway. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we're at, the analogy I use, with, we're probably at the same place now with telomere measurements as we were when we first started measuring total cholesterol. You know, the correlations with, with cardiovascular disease risk and stroke were pretty good, but modest. Um, and, you know, some people could have high cholesterol and have clean coronaries and low cholesterol and have you know, That will always be right, the exactly. case, because people are different. But, but then we got better markers. We got, you know, the breakdown, we got the LDL, LDL we got the small dense LDL, we got the lipoprotein little a. Um, we're not at the point where we have the lipoprotein little a in cholesterol, uh, in telomeres yet. Uh, I think when we get there, you know, when you're below the bottom one percentile, you, you have what's called a telomeropathy, a telomere biology disorder. You don't live as long. And I'm not talking about five years. I'm talking about 30, 40 years. You're dead by 30 if you have, you have it. Or if you're the first generation um, that has the mutation, if the founding mutation, then you might make it to 50. You die of pulmonary fibrosis or bone marrow failure. Um, those people we know with telomere, and all you need is a, just a mean telomere length. Other people where telomeres are important in increasing the risk of cardiovascular disease, Alzheimer's disease, cancer, those more subtle changes, uh, I think we, uh, we're awaiting the technology. There's mean telomere length, there's median telomere, le telomere length, there's the shortest telomere length, and now there's, um, uh, there's something called Tesla, uh, the, the, the telomere length of the shortest one. Telomere, shortest telomere length in the cell. So when we get those, and then we get a more potent therapy, I think we're all going to be focusing on our telomeres even more closely than, than I am now. See, I told you, it's all about telomeres. Yeah, I mean, it, it, well, I think because telomeres affect so many other systems. Uh, I mean, you know, NAD is important. Um, so many other things are important. They're but, all important. You know, uh, I was just listening to, to Jim Laval. We both were, and, mm -hmm. and uh, one area I don't know as much as I'd like to know about is, is the peptides uh, therapies, and, and they are share. they are fascinating. <laughs> and you know the way in which they might be affecting telomere biology is is very interesting they as do. well. But you know you can't be a complete jack of all trades, otherwise you're just a jackass at that point. <laughs> no, <laughs> so. no, I don't think so. I think what's happening is that we are putting it together, and I think that what we saw today with Jim's talk was exactly what you were saying about hormones and telomeres and how we're starting to put it all together. And he was a, that was a perfect example of the more you learn with us, the more you become part of the A4M way of looking at things, functional medicine, prevention, whatever you want to call it, the more likely you are to understand the whole body, the human body, and to provide the, the services that they need to maintain optimum health throughout the ages. Listen, you have Diamantes was saying that we're gonna to live to 120, so. 
I'm, I'm, I'm hoping. <laughs> as long as you're healthy, yes. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think that that's, of course, a very important point is the health span is what matters, not the lifespan. Right. right. Although the day before you're about to die, you feel like the lifespan is still pretty important. <laughs> yeah, right. Um, so, we don't know yet. Yeah. <laughs> so that's great. Well, thank you so much. You're welcome. It was wonderful to have you here. Always happy talking to you again. Anytime. Mm -hmm.